don't know if I'm prepared as much as I'd like to be tonight because this uh, this message has been on me, and it's one that I've uh, I've personally struggled with. Not because it's a hard message, because it's so simple. It's like we're in an amphitheater. Nobody wants to sit beside each other. Look, it just circles around. Circle up the wagons. <laughs> there is a football game going on. And uh, we are competing against that. And that's okay. What are you laughing at? <laughs> oh, I was talking to her. Her. <laughs> we, are, we are braving the odds yet again to come here to listen to this crazy person try to uh, preach a good enough message so I get asked back and to uh, not disappoint because I am a uh, I am a representation of Louisville Bible College so I can't be messing that up they just got out of debt amen, amen. Uh, the goal was $75,000 because this is their 75, 75th year they wanted to do that by December. I'm doing a shameless plug, by the way. Uh, they wanted to do that by December, and it's September. So they met that goal, and that's just amazing. And I, all I can say about that is just praise God. Amen. Because they are faithful, they're uh, trustworthy, they're honest, and they're super cheap. So I would encourage anyone, really, not even if you're not going into ministry to, to take some, take some classes. They do satellite classes, and you can do it as an audit, and it's super cheap. Uh, Twenty-five dollars for an audit, or fifty dollars per credit hour. Uh, if you're an elder, I would definitely ask you to consider taking some of these classes uh, to better deepen your heart, your understanding to be able to uh, do what you're supposed to do, right? Speak hope, light, and life into your congregation to, to be able to shepherd your flock, to actually understand what it, what it is that we're supposed to be doing. I say all that to say we had a hard night last night, or at least I, my wife said that I was pretty hard. I didn't raise my voice not once, but she swears that I did. Uh, but, I, but I could see, last night, we answered two questions, or we answered two things. Does anybody remember what they were? What's the greatest question anyone of all humanity will ever hear? Who do you say that I am? And I think we, we got a good understanding of that. Thank you. But then the most important answer that we will ever hear is, anybody know? That's, that's your answer. The, uh, the answer, you are mine. But why is that so important? Why is that so important? Before I get off track, I do want to say that, yes, we are competing against Dragon Stadium. But we are in the lion's lair this evening. Amen. Amen. Who's got a better chance of winning than Nathan? <laughs> we do have a better chance of winning because he has already won. Amen. We are battling uh, stuff that we need to overcome. The mosquitoes are bad. But it is, it is my hope and my prayer that we will be so full of Christ this evening that when those mosquitoes land on us and they go flying away, they are screaming, there's power in the blood. <laughs> I wanted to bring tonight, there's, there's kind of a theme. Everybody, apparently you have to have a theme uh, when you do revivals. You can't just preach Jesus. You got to be smart and tie a theme into it. But, yes, amen, Ruger. Did you bring your Bible? 
Yeah, he did. So, last night we answered the most, or we found out what the most important question was. We found out what the most important answer will be. But that begs the question, why are human beings so important that the God of the universe would be willing to enter in and die for them on the cross. And I think that a lot of us in the church, and no, I'm not going to pick on the church, but I think that a lot of us in the church have gotten to a point to where we don't think about that enough. We don't truly understand why we are so important. I see some new faces, so I am going to introduce myself real quick. My name is Michael Kelly. I am the husband of one, the father of five, and a follower of one awesome God. Last night we said that this was the Word of God. Anybody bring their Bibles? Anybody need a Bible? I want to make sure. Did you get anybody? Did anybody ask for a Bible last night? Not last night, but there's no. Okay. Even if they're online, if you are online right now and you're listening to this and you need a Bible, send Robbie or send one of the elders, somebody here at the church, your address, and I will get you a Bible because that is a part of my ministry and I want to make sure that that goes forever. But we said that this was the Word of God. In it, we find hope. By it, we find light which will help us as we go through the darkness. And by its author, we will find life. So let's open it together. I ask you to turn in or turn on your Bible because I've, I've seen some phones, and that's perfectly okay. I love it. I love that we have the Word of God accessible at our fingertips. It was, it was told to me today that the reason... The number one reason that people can't get away with murder is because they can track your cell phone, right? And this is for free. You don't have to pay me for this, Robbie. I'm not telling you how to get away with murder, but the reason they're able to track your cell phone is because no one turns it off. And I would love to say that no one turns it off because they have the Word of God readily accessible, but they would rather sit on the TikToks and the Facebooks and do all that. So as you're turning in your Bible, we're going we're gonna to go do a little bit something different. So it's been said that today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. And I believe that we've become very complacent when it comes to the things of the kingdom. I believe that many have become complacent. You know, we hear it Year after year, Sunday after Sunday, we hear it at every revival, every Easter service, every Christmas service. What do we hear? There's good news of great joy. We hear, He is risen. Come and see. And then the week after, it seems that many have forgotten, and that good news of great joy has become the old news of <laughs> whatever. Many really, let's be honest for a minute. Who wants to be here? I said, let's be honest. I like the ones who aren't raising their hands. Thank you, man. Some are only here out of a, 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 a certain perceived sense of obligation or mom or dad asked you to come or your spouse dragged you here. The preacher asked you to come here. You're a Christian, so you feel like you got to show up at least one night. But I've seen multiple people that were here last night, and I'm, I'm so honored that you would be here. And it's okay to be honest, because I was right there with you many years ago. Many of these <laughs> revival services are the same, you could say. It's, it's been said that, they're just as cheap at twice the price. 
And if you've heard one, then you've heard them all. And I'm ready to tell you that that's right. But what, what is it about this story, this, this amazing, amazing story of the love of our Creator that, that it just begs to be heard and read and taught over and over again. Today's no different. You're going to hear about the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. But however, to, tonight, you're, you're not going to hear it from a standpoint that you're used to. You're not going to hear it from the standpoint of the cross. You're not going to hear it from the standpoint of the resurrection. You're actually going to hear it from the standpoint of the beginning. That's why I've entitled this sermon, The Roots of the Resurrection. Now, if you have your Bibles, just go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 2. Rose, you know where that's at? Okay, great. I've got to pick on Rose. Well, I don't know about that, but she, Rose is Rose. All right, let's pray real quick. Father, we're here again, and uh, I'm honored that I would be asked to step in front of this, this group, step in front of this people to share your love. And I'm honored that, that you would allow me to do that. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that this evening we can uh, gain a greater understanding of who you are and what you mean to us or what you should mean to us. Lord, I pray that you will be glorified, magnified in your holy place, but you would be amongst us. Not because the Bible says we're two or more are gathered, because we know that that is regarding church discipline, but simply because you told us, I've got to go away for a little bit, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. Father, we just pray that you will descend upon this, this house of believers, this meeting, and be magnified. Forgive the speaker. For his mistakes are many. And be the authority in his voice. The only authority. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start in Genesis 2. But before we do that, I want to give you a rundown of the gospel. Okay? And it's simple. The gospel message is simple. I kind of feel like I have to. I, I kind of feel like I am contractually obligated by upper management to share this gospel message any and everywhere I go. So here we go. I'm going to do it real quick because that's how quick it is. That's how simple it is. Christ came to this earth. He lived a perfect life as only he was capable. He was betrayed. He was taken into custody. He was beaten and taken to the cross, and he died on our behalf, and he was buried. He resurrected three days later. But whenever I hear preaching, I love that when I watch Andy Griffin. He says, uh, ain't B, you going to go to the preaching this day? Or he says, Barney, you, am I going to meet you at the preaching? So that's what I'm going to call tonight. I'm glad y'all are at the preaching. But the question remains in my head, and it just keeps popping up, Why? Why would the God of all creation, the entire universe, the only God, Elohim, Yahweh, King of kings, Lord of lords, humble himself by stepping out of all of the indescribable yeah. glories of heaven just to die on a cross for us? Why out of all of creation is mankind so important that the one true God would be willing to die for us? And if I was to ask this one question to anyone here at the service today, 
or this evening. It, the most likely the answer that I would get would be that we were formed in the image of God. And you would be completely right in that. But I believe there's more to the story that beats the eye. And I also believe that based upon Scripture, we can find the answer to this in the creation story of mankind. And we can find that at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Wow. The Lord God formed man from the dust, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You see, up to this point, we've read in Genesis, if you know the story, that God had spoken everything into existence. I'm getting ready to give you a big LBC word that I learned. That word means ex nihilio. It means out of nothing, everything. And God is unique in this regard, as he is the only one that's been able to do that. I fancy myself to be a, a woodworker. I'm poor enough that I have to be a Mr. Fix-It. I am a proud graduate of YouTube University. But there's nothing that I've ever fixed. There's nothing that I've ever created with my hands by, by wood or epoxy that is out of nothing. You ever thought about that? We are made in the image of God, so we do have a creative spirit, but there is nothing that is created or can be created that we can do. God alone is unique in this regard. But here in the first part of this verse, we read that God, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. And uh, we're made in his image, correct? So part, part of that is being imaginative. Human beings are instinctly creative as he is creative. But the fact remains that I challenge any one of you today. Million, million dollar challenge. I didn't talk to the elders about this or Robbie. But if anyone can prove me wrong in this, Robbie will personally write you a check for a million dollars. Say it bounce. <laughs> no, and I'm guaranteeing it won't bounce. It's my personal guarantee. Of anyone can create something out of nothing. Man was the first of creation to be formed out of what had already been created. We see in the in this first personal touch of the relationship between God and man, that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Like a potter that forms his clay, we see this personal touch from the creator upon his creation. Now, all of creation was intentional, but we see here in this creation account, the very first glimpse of this special relationship that sets man apart from all other creation. The second part of this verse pictures God taking the man into his, in, into his arms. And I, I just picture it, and it's not ghost. If you're old enough to know that movie, it's not what I'm referring to. But I, I just picture in my mind that, that God himself forms man. Not ex nihilio, not speaking it into existence. He literally grabs the dirt and he forms the man and then he pulls him close. And the second part of the verse says that God took man into his arms and he breathed his very breath. That word for that is nasha macha. 
It even sounds like a breath, right? I'm not really into, into doing the whole Hebrew and popping out Greek words and doing that, but that word is just so, so special. Nasha Nacha. The breath of life. And upon that, man became a living being. God not only personally formed mankind, but in this part of the verse that we see that he himself gave something of himself and made it even more personal. A piece of himself. Let us make man in our image. Mm. This is not the cross, you see, is not the first time that God gave of himself to his creation. Do you understand that? Wow. In verse 19, we read that God formed every beast. He formed every bird. And no one can deny that they're living, right? Unless they get hit by a car or whatever. They get shot. But it was man alone that God gave this personal piece of himself. His very breath. Say it with me. Nasha Nacha. The breath of life. And from this, we see that the cross, it wasn't the first time that God gave of himself. So what is life? What is this breath of life? The breath of life is real life that no one, that can only be found in God alone. John 1, 4. John says, in him was life. In and the life was the light of men. Jesus himself said in John 10, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We said that today, this evening. And then John writes in the sixth chapter, For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life. John writes in his, his first epistle, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is why God Himself thought man so important that He was willing to himself to all the horrors all of the pain all of the suffering of the cross because of sin that separated his most important creation from their creator I told you this night was going to be different because uh, this is just so heavy, and I don't think that we, we really understand this. I don't think that we really teach this importance from the pulpit as much as we should. We talk about He is risen on Easter. We talk about, oh, good news of great joy at Christmas. But we never talk about why we were so important. But in understanding this, we... It kind of poses another question. Since God personally formed man and gave him his very breath, which personally forever up to this point connected God and man, why the need of the cross? <coughs> what could have happened that was so drastic, so insanely despicable that it was able to sever the personal relationship. Chapter 3 tells us that. 
We're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was craftier than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, eat from it, or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely won't die. For God knows that in that day, the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she eat. And then she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and that the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. And then the Lord God called to them and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to? And the man said, The woman who you gave, gave to be with me, she, she's the one that gave me this to eat. And then the Lord said to the woman, he said, what is it that you've done? And then the woman in like turn says, it was the serpent that deceived me and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field and on your belly you will go and dust you will eat and all the days of your life. I want to point out verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's how I know that God loves air conditioning. I had to break up this seriousness. I did not like to be that serious for too long. So God bless anybody that does HVAC. So what could be so horrendous that it would sever this relationship between God and man? Sin. He had his part, but it wasn't the serpent who was strong enough to break this relationship. We always want to blame the devil, but it's our own flesh that causes us to break into sin. What I say last night, I love to sin. My flesh loves to sin. But I have to, I have to control that daily, is what Paul said. You see, it was mankind alone and their free will <clears throat> that we all possess that caused this sin. But then you say, Michael, I, I, I didn't eat this fruit. You say, Michael, I didn't, I didn't hide from God. But haven't you eaten the fruit? Haven't you hidden from God? Don't shake your head, no, Tarpon. We all have. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve didn't hide because they didn't think God could find them. Okay? They hid because they were ashamed. We've all done things that we're not proud of, and these things give us shame. And like Adam and Eve, it's not because we believe that 
God doesn't know what we did or we're smarter than He is, it's because our shame, the shame that comes from our actions, our eyes become opened and in our sin we're separated from God and in our shame we hide from God. But in there lies the beauty. Our hope from this chaos is found in that very next verse. Verse 15. God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right there. Right there in the most powerful verse that can be found in the entirety of the Bible, we have our first glimmer of hope. Absolutely, brother. In this verse, we see the first picture of Jesus. The big church Christianese word for that is proto-evangelium. I will put enmity between your seed and her seed. Don't think of this word bruise as you typically think. You see, when we get a bruise, it goes away in a few days, right? We can, we can go home, and I'm sure the guys that are playing that football game, they're going to have some bruises tonight. But then they're going to go home, and they're going to get in a hot tub, and then within a few days, it's going to, it's going to go away. No, this bruise that is being taught about right here, he will bru you will bruise, he will bruise your head. It's a meaning that is far deeper. It's a, it's a, the meaning of the word used here is crush, to gape open, to break permanently. So we're going to reread that verse with the correct emphasis. Doesn't this mean the same thing, though? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Of, he's going to crush the head of the serpent but it isn't the serpent but, it, but the serpent isn't going to crush the heel. These bruisings are two different words here. In this, we find our hope and we find the roots of the resurrection because you see, Jesus Christ is this very seed of the woman who crushed the head of the serpent and then in return had his heel crushed. You see, our sin is what separates us from God. However, as human beings being the pinnacle of God's creation, why? Because we hold His very breath, right? God couldn't stand that we should be separated from Him. And He sought to remedy the situation the only way possible. So let me say, let me be the first one to say this to you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Absolutely. Right here we see Jesus entering into the scene. God knew that due to the free will of all mankind, we couldn't live away from his, or we couldn't live up to his righteousness. So I, I guess he kind of figured if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. I love my kids. I love my oldest son, Jace. He'll do anything I ask him. He just won't do it right. <laughs> I pick on my son because of Rose, but she don't find it funny, I guess. So in doing so, he did what nobody else could do. God himself entered into his creation. He entered into his creation and made himself the spotless lamb, the only one able to cover all sin. Amen. You get that? We read that. And we think of this little bitty lamb. We think back to Sunday school and there's this little bitty lamb that 
He's going to be the Savior of the world. And I don't think we can fully grasp the intent behind this. You know that Nasha Macha, that breath of life, it doesn't just inhabit you and I as a believer. Do y'all understand that? You ever thought about that? It doesn't just inhabit the believer, but it inhabits all of mankind. Christ came that none should perish, but all should come to repentance and have everlasting life. And God gave his very breath to mankind. He sees all of mankind as special. He has seen all of mankind as being set apart, but not only are we set apart through this entrance of sin we have become separated. And however mankind, though, through this separation, we still have this very breath of God. And as believers in Christ, we're happy to say that we're going to live forever in the presence of the Father. But in reality... It's all of mankind that will live the remainder of all eternity. The difference (laughs) is which side of that chasm you're going to inhabit. Do you know what hell is? I think that's another subject we don't teach on very much. Too often we think of hell as fire and brimstone, darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. From what I've been told and what I've seen, I guess weeping and gnashing of teeth happens every Sunday at offering. Not really. Not really. But we hear all these descriptions of hell, but that's not what true hell is, people. Have you ever really thought about what hell is going to be? There's coming a day when all individuals, all individuals, will stand before the very Creator God. There will be no more hiding. None. No more passing the buck. We will stand before our Creator in the very presence, and just like His question in the garden, we will be personally responsible and will have to answer, What have you done? I don't know about you, but that, um, mm. none of us are going to be able to answer that question in such a way that will satisfy his righteousness. And sadly, some will have to meet his judgment with wrath, and the sentence will be announced. And then for the very first time, now hear me with this, because I'm trying to tell you what hell truly is is for the first time, the first time since the inception of creation, space-time matter, for the very first time that God introduced matter into space, which then created time. This will be the very first time that God, creation, will be separated from Him eternally. Even an atheist boldly proclaims, there is no God contained within them. The Nasha Macha, the very spirit that longs, the very spirit that desires to be reconnected with their Creator. Have you ever thought about atheists? Typically, they are individuals who are very very academic. They are very well read. They, they have read all the philosophy books. They have read any and everything they could in a, in a sense to try to disprove God, but in all reality, they're searching for something. And I believe that many here have found that. And if you haven't found that, I would love to do nothing more than introduce you. But the reason I believe that so many atheists are so academic is because their very soul is longing 
to be reconnected with their Creator, but through their pride, they're unable, unwilling to admit what's truly happening here. Hmm, can you fathom the thought of that? That one day, some will no longer have the slightest connection with God. That, brothers and sisters, that's true torment. That is true darkness. John writes that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. Whoever denies me, denies the Son, does not have the Father. You going to preach with me, bro? Whoever abides in me, you have heard from the beginning, I will also abide in you. This is the promise that He Himself promised us. Everlasting Life. I know that, that many of you don't know me. Um, I know that I've talked to Robbie and Andrea and Rose kind of knows what's, what's happened, but a, f- a few months ago, or let's just say over the past couple of years, I have been in a very bad place mentally. And um, there, was a, there was a point that I didn't know if, if this is what God called me into because I knew that I was called into ministry. I knew that I was supposed to do something for God. I didn't know what that was. You see, I, I, I'd gotten to a place where Everything's just seemed so upside down in the ministry. And it, it really, it not only affected me personally, it, it, it has affected my relationship with the children, my children. It's, it's affected uh, the relationship that I have with my wife. And luckily, gracefully, by the grace of God, we're starting to heal from all. And I know that there's individuals here that may be lifelong Christians, maybe new Christians, that are sitting here in shame. They're sitting here in hiding. But I want you to know that God sees you. And he wants you to know that He went to the cross for you. Levi, He went to the cross for you. He even went to the cross for Tarleton. Rose, he went to the cross for you. And that doesn't mean that that shame is going to go away. It doesn't give us a license to sin, but he knew that we were going to mess up again. But he wants you to know that you are so important, so important to your Creator, that Jesus went to the cross and he was crushed on your behalf, forever establishing himself as your Savior, but also gloriously rising again on the third day, asserting his authority as your Lord, forever affirming to all of creation that he is risen, he is Lord, and not even death could hold him. So I'm asking you today, this evening have you heard the gospel but even more so than that have you felt this gospel have you have you sit and just marinated in all of the presence of God even if you're a believer you can be sitting in the shame are you are you tired of that There's no more running. There's no more hiding. There's no more passing the buck. I implore you, church, to come back, to step out into the coolness of God's presence, the authority of God's Word, the authority of our Savior, and be reconciled 
step into this water of baptism. There's no, there's no power in this. The power comes from the authority of the God who was laid, uh, died on the cross and laid into the tomb and then risen again on that third day. And we do the same thing in our baptism. Our old body is, is laid to rest in this water of baptism and it's raised anew in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask Robbie to come up here. He, he can close us out, but I just so desperately, desperately, desperately want you to know who God is and why he came for you and why you are so important to him. Pray with me, please. Father, we've been sitting in shame for far too long, and some of us are too prideful to come out. Father, I pray that you will strip all the pride away and just let your creation sit in your nasha macha and understand that your breath is what give us life. To know that you are holy and righteous, but you desire a connection with us so much because we are a part of you not only created in your image, but breath bearers of your very essence. I pray for the hearts that are struggling. If they can't come tonight, that's fine. Just work on them, Lord. Bring them back tomorrow. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.